call the meeting of the House Environment and Natural Resources Finance Division to order. A quorum is not present, so we'll wait before we do any minutes, but I think we'll get started. Uh, just members, I believe that uh, one of the bills has been pulled, the uh, House File 731 Veteran Watercraft Fee Exemption has been pulled from the agenda. Um, but we are waiting for Representative Freiberg or Representative Becker Finn is here. Do I see Representative Freiberg at all? How close are we to quorum? Representative Becker Finn, why don't you get on deck and we'll. Ready. Go, Jamie, go. So we have a quorum. Uh, Representative Fisher, have you reviewed the minutes? Yes, I have. Yes, I have, Mr. Chair. I'd like to approve, move the approval of the minutes. For February 21st, is there any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Minutes are approved. Representative Becker Finn, uh, you have House File 266. Uh, House File oh, 133. 133. <laughs> Members, next bill we have up for consideration today is House File 133. It was referred to this division by the Ways and Means Committee. We did hear testimony on this bill on Friday, February 15th. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, do you want to move uh, House File 133 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I will move House File 133, and I do have an amendment that we weren't uh, able to move when we had the hearing on the 15th. Thank you, uh, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, could you please explain your amendment? Yep, uh, so House File 133 is the No Child Left Inside bill and the amendment uh, based on some conversations we had in uh, environment policy uh, just makes clear that the the point of the bill is to serve children with limited opportunities to participate in natural resource based outdoor activities so just making clear that that's the um, population that we're trying to reach with this bill and then we also um, removed the exemption from rulemaking um, so that folks are more comfortable uh, with the rulemaking process still happening. So I would move the A1 amendment. So Representative becker -Finn moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape she would, she would like. Is there any discussion on the A1 amendment? Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative becker -Finn. I just wanted to, I know a lot of the people weren't here when we had the off-campus meeting, and I just wanted to express my uh, opposition to this amendment one of the things about the bill that I liked was that uh, uh, we were going to be able to put some stuff in place without having to worry about uh, uh, agencies making the making the rules for it. And what you've done here is is dumped it back in their laps. It's a it's a vague bill to begin with, and uh, so I probably won't be voting for your amendment. And I'll be interested <laughs> in talking with the agency to see what they have in process now, uh, because. I know you had also said that you didn't have time to look into what you wanted the money to be spent for, so you just wanted to put it into uh, into someone else's hands. So we'll, we'll be talking about that later, but I just wanted you to know that uh, I don't agree that we should be uh, giving the rulemaking authority for this. If it is if it is specifically for no child left inside, then we should be able to be specific on uh, on what we want the money to go for. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to be clear, the, the reason I added that to the amendment was based on some of the members on, on your side of the aisle who had some misgivings about um, not going through the regular rulemaking process. So, but, you know, we, we can all disagree. And, and to clarify, I mean, it's the, the bill's one page long. It's pretty clear what, what the money is going for. Um, so, I mean, the idea is not that we would just give a bunch of money to the department without guidelines. There's um, really specific guidelines about providing students with opportunities to directly experience and understand nature and the natural world, to use research-based, effective, environmental, ecological, agricultural, other natural resource-based uh, educational curriculum, maximizing participants, uh, making good use of the public spaces we already have, committing matching funds, and now with the amendment, um, also focusing on serving children with limited opportunities. So um, I think it's pretty clear about what we're trying to accomplish with this bill. Representative Fabian? Nope. Did you, any dis any further discussion on the A1 amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay? No. no. Ayes have it. Amendment is adopted. To uh, Representative Becker Finn to 133 as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We already had a, a full uh, discussion with really great public testimony uh, at the field hearing out at Dodge Nature Center, and um, just happy to continue moving this bill forward. Are there any uh, questions from members? Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, in the amendment that's been adopted, uh, <clears throat> uh, item number four that you've inserted. What is the definition of uh, children with limited opportunities? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, children with limited opportunities. <laughs> um, so not kids like mine or maybe grandkids like yours, but kids who are otherwise don't have um, the opportunities to, to access our great outdoors. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you can access the great outdoors by stepping outside the door of your dwelling, right? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I would venture to guess that standing on the stoop of your apartment building is maybe not so great. Um, and the, the point here is that we have kids that are meaningfully engaged with spending time outside. Um, there was actually a, a news story that just came out today that actually children who spend more time in green spaces um, have better mental health outcomes. You know, and as we discussed um, previously when we had the full testimony, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why um, we want to engage our kids with um, conservation, our public parks and public spaces. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm, the only neg negative, uh, you know, questioning I've received on this bill has been in committee. I've heard nothing but, but you know, support from the public who are excited about this bill and some of the opportunities that it, that it will bring forward. Representative Green. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, would the uh, commissioner uh, be able to come down and uh, so we can ask if they have any ideas as to what they're going to do as opposed to maybe some of the things that they've already tried that are working and aren't working? Uh, Representative Green, I think uh, as we've we've had testimony on it, but because the DNR is here, uh, I would ask if uh, Representative S Smith is going to come. Oh, they're outside. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Representative Becker Finn. Thank you. Um, you know, while we're waiting to kind of reiterate, because I know, um, you know, in the, the field hearing, not everyone was there, but I think um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Sometimes you have to say things multiple times before people hear you uh, in, in this building, particularly. But the idea is to not supplant the programs that we already have, but to supplement them and make sure we're reaching even more people in our communities. Commissioner Meyer, uh, Representative Green, do you want to yes. say your? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I know it's been stated that this bill is, is specific. I don't read it as specific. And what I'm wondering, uh, Deputy Commissioner, is, is what programs have you have, do you have out there right now for youth? Uh, which ones are working, which ones aren't? And then the third question would be, what do you have in mind for this? Is this your bill? Did you ask for this? or? Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Meyer. members for the record, Bob Meyer, Department of Natural Resources, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, the last question first, this is not our bill. We were engaged and requested by Representative Becker Finn to work with her on this issue. 
we've been discussing the needs that are out there and what we can do. And as I stated previously in testimony of this committee on this bill, this is intended to supp supplement, not supplant, our existing fundings. I have, there's a ton of outdoor education and, and recruitment retention programs that the department has. We can provide a list of those to the committee. I know we presented a lot of that information uh, last week at, at the Dodge Nature Center where it was a deep discussion about our activities. And I think there was testimony from our staff out there on that as well. So um, I can provide that again if, you, if you're interested. Um, our recruitment retention activities within Fish and Wildlife, we do a, a number of grants. We do a, a ton of ICANN programs, the Division of Parks and Trails. Also our safety training programs, firearm safety, snowmobile, ATV programs, our outreach to bring people into the, the outdoors. So I, rather than go into each one of those programs, we can certainly present that information to the committee again if you desire. Um, we see a need for this. It's, as I said, it, it's, to, it's to go beyond what we're doing, reaching out into the communities, getting community support. For example, um, the Somalian community. They, they aren't gonna listen to a person such as myself to go in there and say, you should try camping, you should try hunting. We need to have one of their own people message to them and get them to understand that it's not afraid, don't be afraid to sleep in a tent at night in a state park, right? You're, you're perfectly safe going out fishing, kayaking, boating, whatever it's gonna be. And it needs to come from the local community, not from the DNR is what we're finding in a lot of cases. This Hispanic community, we have an outreach coordinator in our fisheries programs, reaching out specifically to his, his, a Hispanic person, reaching out to Hispanics. And that buy-in, that trust, and the just comfort level is where things need to be taken place. And that's kind of where there's a gap right now. So that's one of the opportunities for this program. Many others, I think, that have been discussed at multiple hearings on this issue. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, it, it, and I'm not gonna belabor it, I'm just gonna make a comment. Uh, once again, the state is coming in and they're going to pretend that they can uh, solve all our problems. And you just got done saying something that I believe for many years, which is the state doesn't have all these answers. And if the local communities would get involved, they, they could handle their own problems without having to run to a big government to uh, ask permission or to get funding for something that they should be doing themselves. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two questions real quickly. Um, this would be to the author. Uh, line 2.4, uh, we got two blank uh, there. There's no fiscal appropriation yet. And do you have an idea of how much, I mean, this is a finance committee. Do you have an idea of how much money you are going to be requesting? Representative becker -Fin. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, um, as as much as the chair uh, deigns to to give to this uh, this effort, um, you know, we just have recently gotten the budget numbers, but you know, um, even a, even a small amount could potentially do a lot of good um, in our communities. Representative Fabian, thank you, Mr. Chair. And the second blank, <clears throat> then uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer, um, what fund uh, in the agency would you recommend that these dollars come from? Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Representative Fabian, the general fund, of course. Good luck. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, uh, Representative becker do you have any closing comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just add that, that this, this bill is written in a way so that it's not just about recruitment and retention, um, but also maybe some other environmental-based programs like the ones that were discussed um, at Dodge Nature Center. So it's, it's not... Uh, it's a yes and situation. And then um, just want to speak to, you know, this idea of things coming from, from the grassroots and for c giving uh, opportunities to, for, to communities to do this kind of work. And um, finally, you know, when we ask questions about which programs are working or not working, I think the important question is always who are those programs working for and who are they not working for? So um, I, like I said, I've, I've, I've heard a lot of good things and a lot of good ideas, people from the community coming to me saying, um, with ideas of how they might be able to make use of, of a fund like this and a program like this. So thank you for your support. Representative Beckerfin renews her motion that House File 133 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Representative Freiberg. Members, the next bill we have up for consideration today is House File 266. It was referred to this division by the Ways and Means Committee. We heard testimony on this bill on Friday, February 15th. I move that House File 
266 be recommend recommended to be re referred to Ways and Means with record re recommended referral to the Legacy Finance Division. Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for uh, considering this bill both last Friday and again today. Um, just a quick refresher, this is the bill uh, to fund uh, $5 million from the Clean Water Fund to the Met Council for grants uh, or loans for local inflow and infiltration reduction programs addressing high priority areas. It's an issue I've been working on for several years dating back to my time on the Golden Valley City Council. We have a, uh, a robust point of sale program uh, in Golden Valley to address issues of inflow and infiltration. So whenever Clearwater, uh, for any home that goes on the marketplace uh, in Golden Valley has to be inspected if there are cracks in the pipes uh, and causing inflow and infiltration where clear water gets into the sanitary sewer system. Uh, it's incumbent upon the person selling their house to repair that. Costs um, of it are very expensive, um, potentially five or ten thousand dollars, or sometimes even more. Um, and uh, so this, you know, this is a program we had in place a few years ago in 2013. Many people in my area and around the metro took advantage of it uh, just to deal with some of these costs. Uh, it would be great to have it. Would be great to have it in place again. Um, I'll leave it at that, um, but happy to answer any questions from members since we did already discuss this and there are a couple people here. If there are technical questions, who can answer those as well. Are there any questions? Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> this may be a question for staff, but uh, Representative Freiberg, um, this is high priorities in the metropolitan area and there's $5 million here and you talked about this costing up to $10,000 to make these repairs. What types of programs do we have for Greater Minnesota with regards to these issues? Representative Freiberg. Uh, I can't, um, I can't speak to, I know there are, there, there's two, there are some programs in place for private sewer lines and there's some in place for public, uh, public <clears throat> lines as well. Um, so, you know, this just, to, this just is to address the, the private area. Um, in, the metro, in the metropolitan area, um, it, the Metropolitan Council has started surcharging cities in the area, so there's a specific need there. I know in Golden Valley we had to do something like 300,000, oh, I don't even remember the amount. We, had, we were going to have to pay um, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars for a city of 20,000 uh, residents to address this issue. So this is addressing that. I can't speak to everything that's out there in greater Minnesota, but if staff is available to answer it. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, why would you be excluding rural Minnesota from this? Uh, I'm uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian. I'm cer it's certainly not my intention to uh, exclude any part of the state. Um, I'm just trying to address a specific um, a specific situation that is caused in part by the Metropolitan Council surcharge situation. So, by definition, that addresses that applies in the metro area. Maybe Representative Fabian, in the metropolitan area, it must be done. There's no cost share. There's no uh, best management practices. This is a requirement that's done in, in the metropolitan area. And so um, I think that's what, and the, the difference here is uh, Representative Freiberg's bill is on private sewer lines. Mm -hmm. The issue is ex exists throughout the state, but uh, outside the metropolitan area, there is not a penalty provided to the homeowner, to the city, uh, like there is in the metropolitan area. So, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So to that point, what is the penalty? <clears throat> the penalty is that the Metropolitan Council will assess a fee uh, to the city uh, based on the increased water flow that is happening from, fl from the inflow into the water system. And they will charge the city to reduce the amount of flow <laughs> rather than build the excess capacity for the wastewater system. So with aging infrastructure, the, the system has to handle that water, and clear water will have to be treated just like wastewater. In addition, uh, where sometimes it occurs, if the pipes are underwater, you may have the leakage of the wastewater into the groundwater as well. So it's inflow and outflow uh, occurring. So, and there are people from Met Council here, but there are significant charges that are made by the city, by the Met Council to, the, to try to get these fixed. So then the cities pass ordinances where they require inspections uh, of the wastewater system and they will assess a charge uh, for fixing it. So there, 
city inspectors will come into the home and they will have to uh, let the inspector in. They'll run a, a camera through the pipe. If there's a, it needs to be fixed, then they will do that fixing and assess the homeowner. I think in Representative Freiburg's area, uh, they're doing that at the point of sale when there's a transfer of property. And to my knowledge, no such program exists in Greater Minnesota. Yeah, I believe they. I believe when we heard testimony uh, at Dodge Nature Center, the the mayor from West St. Paul and your area also spoke and said that they had put a similar ordinance in place, a point of sale program. And this, I should mention too, this just. It works out to something like a third of the cost that the, to the homeowner that this grant program would, would would cover. So it's not the full cost. The both the city and the and the homeowner are expected to pick up some of the costs as well. At least that's the way it's worked in the past. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm curious to know how much money the Clean Water Fund has in it. And I apologize to Mr. Hagemeyer for putting him on the spot here. If you can't answer, we can do it later. That's right. Uh, Mr. Chair, Represent Fabian, there is some carry forward money coming in, but this biennium would be looking at appropriating somewhere in $250 million range for the biennium. Representative Fabian. So, th thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Representative Freiburg, um, have you been to the Clean Water Council? Has this come through the Clean Water Council, correct? And have you. Representative Freiburg. Uh, I have not been to the Clean Water Council. Uh, I know this, this program has been in place before. Uh, we had a similar, we had an almost identical program in place in, during the 2013-14 biennium. And I believe at that point it did not. Representative Fabian. Not Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. I'd be curious to know what the Clean Water Council has to say about this uh, request. Um, and maybe if I could jump in, Representative Fabian. Please. So out of the billion dollars that have been distributed in the Clean Water Fund over the last 10 years, $1 million have gone to this program. And the Clean Water Council will never recommend money going to this because they have things they want to spend the money on. So we've had one million out of one billion that have gone to this versus 60 to 70 million potentially per year for cost share in greater Minnesota. One million out of one billion has gone to this urban program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this may be a question you can answer, Mr. Chair, but if Representative Freiburg knows, that would be fine. I'm just trying to understand, um, because I'm somewhat familiar with PFA and how Public Facilities Authority money is spent and how they prioritize projects. <clears throat> it doesn't sound like that is happening um, through the Met Council, that they're just trying to work on this issue as they have opportunities when permits are requested or when there's a transaction occurring and I'm wondering uh, is that uh, a normal process you said this is something that was done quite some time ago would do you know if there is a way to prioritize where you're gonna have the biggest bang for your buck in terms of the investment or is it really that piecemeal process as I understand it whereas there's just an opportunity we try to work on it Representative Freiburg. Yes, if you look at line 1.9 of the bill, it does uh, speak to addressing this in high priority areas. And I know that the Met Council does measure <coughs> excess flow um, into their into their sanitary sewer system. So um, they, I mean, it might be better. It might, it might, there are representatives of the Met Council here. They can, I know they can talk about um, the system that they've put in place before, but they, it's not willy nilly. They do, it, they, do make an, they do make sure that it goes to the areas with the greatest need. Representative Heisman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So it sounds like they're looking at a specific area and prioritizing us that area as opposed to a prioritizing projects because there may be projects that would have a greater benefit than another or uh, specific properties that they're watching that they may want to say, we know there's a problem on this particular property that's maybe greater than on another location. And because there's only $5 million appropriated, maybe that will have the impact that you want. But I am curious. If, if it could have a greater impact if it was focused on specific areas where we have a greater need. Representative Freiburg? Yeah, it's it's not, foc uh, thank you, Representative Heinzman, Chair, uh, Mr. Chair. It's not focused on a specific area, but it is focused on areas where there is excess flow, essentially. Um, so Golden Valley is one such area. That's, that's where I represent, you know, there's bad soils there, so they do have 
greater inflow and infiltration than other areas I understand and representative Hansen chair Hansen's district there's a similar issue so I mean it, it, it addresses the priority areas within it, it, it just addresses basically any house that applies for it within those priority areas <laughs> Um, is there any further discussion? Is there anyone in the audience that would want to testify? Anyone in the audience? Seeing none, I renew my motion that House File 266 be recommended to be re-referred to the Ways and Means uh, Committee with a recommended referral to the Legacy Finance Division. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion adopted. Thank, Thank you, you. Representative Freiburg. And for those of um, folks who came in later, House File 731 has been pulled from the agenda. Uh, so we will begin with the Department of Natural Resources budget overview. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. For the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. Just a little logistical uh, information for you, how we're going to lay out our budget presentation today. Um, Commissioner Stroman is here. She's going to do the opening remarks, and unfortunately, she does have to leave for prior, previous commitment. Uh, Mary Robeson, our CFO, and myself will be here. We'll be bringing up division directors to present their budgets and answer questions specifically <coughs> on those protections, and then go from there, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Commissioner, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, members. Again, uh, for the record, my name is Sarah Stroman. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources. And I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to present the Governor's One Minnesota Budget recommendations for the DNR. As Assistant Commissioner Meyer said, my role really here today is just to set the stage and then um, others will follow with the uh, detail of the individual budget recommendations. As just a, a bit of a refresher um, from when we were here with our agency overview, the DNR has a three-part mission. And that mission is to work with residents to conserve and manage the state's natural resources, to provide outdoor recreation opportunities, and to provide for the commercial use of natural resources in a way that creates a sustainable quality of life. And as I've said on a number of occasions over the last month and a half, I really believe that this broad mission um, perfectly positions the department to engage uh, Minnesota's residents as one Minnesota. Our staff and our stakeholders represent a diversity of perspectives of values, diversity of perspectives and values, and we all share this passion for Minnesota's outdoors and natural resources. And so our opportunity really is to bring together this passion, this diversity of perspectives and robust discussion to find the best outcomes for Minnesota. I think as uh, we can all agree, all too often natural resource issues are framed as issues that divide us. Whether that frame is rural versus urban or pro-environment versus pro-jobs, um, really forging Minnesota's future does not require picking winners and losers. It requires us to work together. And so to that end, the governor's budget recommendations for DNR are comprehensive and they promote the prosperity of communities across Minnesota uh, in, in a few areas here. The first is protecting our natural resources. Second, making smart decisions with good information. Third, connecting people with the outdoors. And finally, addressing the operational needs of the agency to ensure high quality services to all Minnesotans. Again, uh, throughout all of this work, uh, we will approach that work, as our mission says, by working with Minnesotans, uh, Minnesota residents, engaging all Minnesotans affected by our decisions, welcoming all perspectives, encouraging robust discussion, and coming together as one Minnesota to find the best outcomes for our state. 
And with that uh, introduction, I'd like to turn it over to our Chief Financial Officer, Mary Robison, who will walk through um, the, the kind of high level picture of what the governor is recommending for the Department of Natural Resources. Commissioner, let me just see if there's anyone, if you have to leave, if there's anyone that has any questions for you. Excellent work. Thank you. Ms. Robeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Mary Robison, Chief Financial Officer for the Department of Natural Resources. We went through this slide uh, briefly in our overview, so I'm just going to touch on it very briefly here as a reminder that the DNR's uh, 1819 budget was about $1.8 two billion dollars spread across 50 different funds and again it's an extremely complex budget one of the most complex uh, state agencies budget wise and so please as we go through uh, all the budget proposals we'll be talking about different funding sources as well as one-time funds um, and pass through dollars so feel free to ask any questions and we're here uh, to help you understand the initiatives as well as the DNR's uh, budget in general Just to give an overview of the DNR, of the governor's recommendation for the DNR, the base budget for 2021 for DNR is just over $1 billion. This reflects the loss of one-time funding, particularly around the legacy funds and the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as well as other statutory changes to the base. The governor's proposed budget for 2021 is $1.191 billion in 2021, dropping just slightly to 1.089 in the out years. You'll notice of this, um, the huge majority of it is the restoration of the legacy funds for the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund and the Clean Water Funds. That's 84 million of that total increase. The remainder constitutes a 5% increase over DNR's base budget. In the general fund, the increase is $24 million for the 2021 biennium. And I'll just note as we go through our presentation today, all of the numbers that we'll be going through are biennial numbers, so something to be aware of. The expenditures are partially offset by $10 million of biennium in revenues, and $8 million of those revenues are from proposed fee increases in our package, uh, most notably the boat registration fee and AIS uh, proposed fee increases that we will cover. <coughs> Just a brief note that the, the governor's budget does include a proposed tax increase and wanted to be sure you were aware that under current law, Minnesota Statute 296A.18, there are six accounts at the DNR that receive gas tax receipts and you can see the allocation here on the slide. Under the governor's proposed uh, gas tax increase, these accounts would receive about $16 million over the biennium. And we do have uh, one proposal out of water rec that would spend some of these receipts. So we're also just bringing this up to say that uh, when Director Erica Rivers of Parks and Trails goes through the Parks and Trails items, that some of the uh, boat access investments that, that the governor's budget is proposing are funded in part by gas tax receipts. And with that. Excuse me, Representative Fabian. I'm sorry. Thank Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Robison, um, on, on the previous page where you did your this here, I'm yeah. curious to know how uh, 2021 you have a uh, 2.4, is that 2.4 million, or excuse me, 24 million. How do you go from 24 to 15 in the tails there? Yeah. How is that possible? Ms. Robison. Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, there are a number of one-time items in the governor's budget um, out of the general fund. So some of the notable ones include that there is a one-time uh, recommendation for legal fees in 2021, which we will go through. There is also a one-time study of water use in the Pineland Sands area that is, again, one-time, one point, uh, about $1.9 million for the biennium. And also, for example, the governor's uh, CWD proposal, which includes a general fund component, uh, is higher in the 2021 biennium than it is in the out years. So altogether, those one-time items make the general fund investment uh, drop in 2023. And as we go through our proposals, we'll be sure to highlight which are one-time. Thank you. Proceed. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, that concludes kind of our high level overview in the gas tax. Now we'd like to bring up Director Erica Rivers to start the parks and trails discussion. Ms. Rivers, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, this isn't working. Okay. All right. Um, my name is Erica Rivers, for the record, Director of Minnesota State Parks and Trails from the Department of Natural Resources. I'm here today to talk about, as Commissioner Stroman mentioned, um, uh, some of the uh, ways that the governor's budget will enhance uh, community prosperity, particularly within um, our outdoor recreation system and the benefits that they provide for local communities. I'm going to run through five budget initiatives that the part of the governor's budget. Two of these are fee increases. Uh, one in water recreation, as um, uh, CFO Robeson mentioned, as well as one in cross-country ski. Two appropriation increases, one in the general fund for state trails operations and maintenance, and one in the ATV or RV accounts. Uh, and the last item will be a technical fix um, from a statutory change that was made last year. So the first um, recommendation in the governor's budget is a fee increase for water recreation. The last time our boat fee registrations were increased for 2006, so it's been quite some time since we've had a fee increase. Um, as many of you in this uh, committee know, given your legislative districts, um, the water recreation system is a real keynote or keystone part of our outdoor recreation um, economy within the state of Minnesota. It contributes about $5.5 billion to the outdoor recreation economy with about 826,000 boats registered in the state of Minnesota. That makes us the largest per capita boat registration or boat ownership in the state or in the nation. Um, so very big um, uh, implications for our economy. At the heart of that is a, a very robust outdoor recreation, outdoor or water recreation boating system that is supported by uh, public water access sites, water trails, as well as um, uh, um, fishing piers. Part of this account is also used not just for the water recreation system, but some of those water recreation fees also used to support uh, the Division of Enforcement. Part of our mission is to ensure public safety on our public waters, and we do that through a series of grant programs to local units of government for water safety, as well as uh, funding part of our um, conservation officer salaries. And finally, the last part of this um, re recreation or a water recreation proposal um, serves our ecological and water resources division, um, which supports their shoreland program, their wild and scenic rivers, as well as uh, floodplain and aquatic plant management. At present levels, um, the current lo the current uh, system of water recreation, in particular public water access sites, are simply not sustainable. We can't sustain them at the level they are already are. As many of you in this committee have commented in previous sessions, um, the the department has all but stopped acquiring new public water access. Uh, uh, sites at this point, um, we are strictly um, through the inflationary pressures and growth in the system, we're, we're largely just sustaining the system that we have at reduced levels of service to our customers. Um, so this um, budget initiative is, a, is an attempt then to, to fix that issue. Any questions? Representative Fabian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Director Rivers, um, on the watercraft fee increases, a fairly typical boat in Minnesota would be an 18-foot boat. Um, can you tell me what the current fee is and what the proposal would bring it to? <clears throat> Ms. Rivers. Mr. Chair, members, uh, thank you, Representative Fabian. If you look on page 52 of your bu um, uh, budget book, the proposed fee increases for the water recreation accounts are there. Um, the current fee to your question, Representative Fabian, for Pleasure Craft 17 to 19 feet, it was currently uh, registration fees would be about $27. Uh, that would go to $39.25. I should note that in this um, fee proposal, fee increase proposal, all of the fee increases are between 25 and 45 percent of their current values, um, and that this proposal is scalable depending on uh, you know what what we want to do here. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then the other question I have is, is um, a, an increase in fees in cross-country uh, pass. <coughs> you know, we've had some issues in my part of the state with regards to um, maintaining the trails and so forth. What assurances can you give me that 
uh, those trails are going to continue to be uh, available to the public and uh, maintained by the DNR. Ms. Rivers. Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian and members, um, this is the uh, one I had pl planned to talk about third, but we'll talk about now in the interest of this question. Um, we are proposing a fee increase for this uh, cross-country ski pass um, that will generate approximately uh, $140,000 over the biennium, $70,000 each year. Uh, this fee increase is supported very well by the Minnesota Nordic Ski Association. They have uh, been seeking this fee increase for about eight years. Um, so it is a user-based fee that they are requesting. It will be used to spend, uh, increase grooming on 22 state parks and also for um, grant and aid on about 700 miles of locally initiated and groomed trails in the grant and aid system. The majority of these funds will then go to the grant and aid system. About uh, $35,000 of it would go to uh, maintaining the level of grooming that we have currently in state parks. As Representative Fabian and others are aware, uh, we, because of the shortfalls in the previous um, biennia, we have uh, cur carved out or, or, or scaled back the level of grooming that is occurring within our state parks across the system to address that shortfall. Um, it is unlikely that these, these dollars would restore uh, state park grooming of those trails, but they would provide additional grant and aid funds for those trails to be groomed by uh, grant and aid groups within um, the communities. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that. Um, so uh, when I look at the different trail systems that we have in Minnesota, cross-country ski, snowmobile, ATV, um, all of the users of those tra trail systems have to pay a fee. Um, why does the DNR not bring forth a fee for, say, bicycle trails? <clears throat> I'll ask uh, CFO Robeson to flip back a slide now. Representative Fabian, I think we should have conferred before uh, I, I presented today. <laughs> okay. Got these slides in the right order for you. Um, so the the other uh, appropriation increase that we are requesting um, is one from general fund. As as this committee is aware, uh, we have come here uh, expressing our concerns about the ongoing operations and maintenance of our state trail system over over several biennia. This year, the governor is recommending one million dollar increase in appropriation from the general fund a million dollars each year, two million dollars for the biennium to address the shortfall in operations and maintenance. In short, what's happening here is that we have an increase in the number of miles of state trails, about 150 miles of increase um, over the last decade. And our operations funding has remained uh, very uh, flat, uh, slightly increasing um, uh, with the, the pace of inflation. So what has uh, happened as a result of that is we are now funding our tr state trails operations and maintenance at about $900 per mile less than we were 10 years ago. Um, so what this general pro fund appropriation um, seeks to do is to provide um, uh, in increased operations and maintenance dollars to address those, that shortfall. To Representative Fabian's question about uh, fee increases or some sort of fee for uh, bicycles, um, this has been debated uh, in this committee uh, previous years. We certainly um, could have that discussion again. Um, one of the primary reasons that that um, has not gone forward, in my understanding, is that the, largely the user groups for bicycles don't support this. Um, state trails are one of the easiest, frankly, ways for people to get outdoors. There was mentioned earlier um, uh, people getting outdoors and how easy it is to do that. One of the reasons it becomes easy to do is because we have state infrastructure that in, is invested in uh, outdoor recreation such as state trails. Um, these trails are not just used by bicyclists, they're used by inline skaters, they're used by uh, mothers with um, uh, strollers, they're used with um, you know people walking their dogs. Um, so it's uh, difficult to um, put a, a fee or a tax on one user group when many benefit. So that's been one of the challenges we've had in the past. Thank you. Representative Heinzman. Page 52, you mentioned the fee schedule here. I'm just looking at the proposed fee increase, say, of watercraft owned by nonprofit organization. And it goes from 450 to 575. But there's also the proposed AIS surcharge. So in that category, we'd be looking over a 100% increase. Is that right? 
Mr. Chair, sure. members, uh, Representative Heitzman, that is correct. Um, there are two separate fees here that we're addressing. One will be the AIS fee, uh, which will universally go to $7.25 from $5. My colleague, uh, Steve Colvin, is here to testify to that AIS increase. Representative Fabian? Any other questions? Or Representative Heitzman. Oh. Ms. Rivers. Thank you. Members, the fourth uh, fee uh, appropriation increase will come from the ATV and ORV accounts. Um, we're recommending an increased appropriation from those accounts um, to cover uh, a very um, uh, large and, and growing uh, ATV OHV system within the state of Minnesota. Um, several of the um, proposals for funding um, that this appropriation would fund have already been, I, I think, to this committee or, or to, I think it's been to this committee, hasn't it, Bob? Prospectors. Yes. Yeah, prospectors, uh, Voyagers, and um, uh, the Taconite State Trail projects would come from that increased appropriation. Um, we are working very closely with the Minnesota Four-Wheel Drive Association as well as the ATV Association of Minnesota on um, how this appropriation would be spent to on the highest priorities uh, for the user groups within the state of Minnesota. As you'll recall, um, the ATV fees were increased during last biennial budget session. Um, this is uh, because those accounts are now healthy, it allows us to have a higher appropriation there. In addition to um, work that we would do in uh, or on state trails um, or, or grant and aid trails, um, supporting grant and aid trails around the state of Minnesota. This appropriation would also provide a little additional, uh, additional funding for our division enforcement to enforce uh, ATV related um, registration and rules uh, associated with those increased um, trail systems. And Be finally, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Mr. Chair and members, the, the last item that is part of the governor's budget uh, related to the operations of state parks and trails is a technical fix. Last uh, biennium, we had uh, a state trail special account created. Um, unfortunately, we neglected to actually get authorization to appropriate dollars from that account. Um, this account, these kind, this account um, is a recipient of special use permit fees um, for things like the John Bear Grease sled dog race, for example. Um, and we have, uh, uh, fees associated with those special use permits and when um, the the event is over um, sometimes there is cleanup and maintenance work that needs to be done after the fact this account will allows for uh, the department to recover the cost of that kind of work in the interest of time I am NOT going to spend much time on the, the last three of these slides because I'm quite certain they'll be heard in the legacy um, funding committee um, they every year biennium um, the governor appropriates dollars from the legacy account to the Department of Natural Resources for Parks and Trails. Um, the governor's recommendation this year reflects the 40-40-20 split that was agreed upon back in 2013 amongst the implementing agencies, Metropolitan Council, uh, Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission, as well as the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and so these numbers all reflect those uh, priorities or, or that funding split. Um, and in the committee, uh, in the future, we'll have a testimony about what the uh, proposed spending of the, um, those dollars would be in alignment with the 25-year Parks and Trails Legacy Plan. So uh, this first slide covers the DNR um, uh, appropriation. The second slide um, is a pass-through, essentially, for Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails. DNR acts as the, the fiscal agent for those grants so that they don't have to set up a whole other um, administration of those grants. We, uh, we do grant pass-through on all kinds of different things um, and follow the Office of Grants Management Policy, um, so there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. We can uh, serve that function with our partners uh, pretty easily uh, within the Division of Parks and Trails. And then finally, um, the last of those uh, appropriations is the off-the-top appropriation of about 1% for coordinating with partners. We've had a tremendous amount of great work happening between the systems. I, I like to say that Minnesotans don't really care if they're on a state trail or a regional trail. They just want to know that they're well-connected and connected to their communities. So um, that has been fostered in tremendous ways with, through these coordinating with partners, through the Legacy Advisory Committee. Um, and through most recently the Great Outdoors website, which was funded through this uh, appropriation in previous biennium. And with that, I'll take any questions. 
Representative Wagini, yes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> the the border to border route um, has that final alignment been done? Ms. Rivers. Mr. Chair, Representative Wigenius, the border-to-border -border route is not finalized at this point. Um, this is for members um, a route, an uh, off-road vehicle, four-wheel drive route that goes from the North Shore over to the um, uh, North Dakota border. Um, we have had quite an extensive, long public process um, involved working with townships along the, the proposed route. Um, along the way, there were a couple of townships in northern Minnesota that expressed some concerns about the route going through their townships. And so we are currently in the process of realigning um, that route to a, a different location where the communities are more amenable to it. Representative Wigginius, any more? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Fabian mentioned uh, bicycles and user groups that are on the trail systems. I happen to have the Paul Bunyan Trail cutting right through my property. I have acreage on both sides. Mm -hmm. And so we're quite close to all that that's going on there. And I'm wondering, you mentioned that the user groups were consulted on fees or potential for fees. And it's been an ongoing conversation for as long as I've been here and probably as long as just about everybody's been here. Uh, I'm, I am wondering who those people are that have been consulted because as I'm over in Cuyuna, Cuyuna and Representative Lewick's district and I'm talking with um, a lot of the folks that are uh, cyclists in, in my district and uh, I, I'm not hearing the same thing you're hearing. Um, I'm wondering if that's something that is uh, localized to one part of the state because, you know, up in my neck of the woods, there's people that say, you know what, I've made an investment of five, ten, and in some cases, thirty thousand dollars in a bicycle. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to have a maintained surface, and it's important to us as a group. I've heard some of those folks make those comments, mm -hmm. um, even over in, like I said, Cuyuna. Here again, some pretty expensive equipment. I, mm -hmm. People are spending more on their bicycle now than they are on my, like I might spend on a snowmobile. Uh, so if you could help me understand who's who's being consulted there, I'd appreciate that. Mr. Chair and members, uh, Representative Heitzman, thank you for that question. Um, we can share some information that we have collected on um, user willingness to pay in the past um, about this. Um, I don't have that data in front of me here. Um, we do know that there are um, uh, cyclists in particular trail users have been consulted in the past and uh, asked that question about whether they would use the state trail more or less if, if there was a fee associated with it. Um, and uh, we can share those results with you. I, I'm not feeling comfortable uh, trying to, to pull those off the, the back of my brain right now. But I, I'm certainly willing to share that with you. Um, there are other user groups. Um, Parks and Trails Council of Minnesota in particular has been um, pretty, uh, uh, pretty open about their um, desire not to have a fee for um, for uh, trail related uses. Um, there are also other bike um, alliance type groups within the cities that have expressed similar um, concerns about uh, being the only ones uh, required to pay a fee when multiple people benefit from those trail resources. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would just add to that, I guess. Uh, we have lots and lots of examples of groups that could be uh, excluded from paying those costs, kids and others. We've come up with a lot of creative ways to try and, and make sure that if there is someone that might be unfairly affected by a fee, that uh, there would be a way for them to avoid a cost that would otherwise restrict them or hurt their access. And I, I hope that, you know, as we're looking at some of this, I mean, I mentioned the line item for watercraft owned by nonprofit organizations. That's my youth camps and uh, all kinds of uh, groups in my, in my district. I'm thinking specifically of some that works, work very closely with, 
with handicapped kids and disabled kids, and they have literally dozens of these things, and it, it's well over 100% increase. That affects their ability to service kids from all over the state. And I think Representative Becker Finn was talking earlier about how we're trying to make sure that people can get out of their houses and access the outdoors. And uh, when Camp Confidence is looking for donations to try to cover those sponsorships, that how many kids does that mean don't get to go to camp? And uh, if we can suggest at the agency level that Camp Confidence pays hundreds of dollars more potentially for fees at their nonprofit, that's pretty unpopular in my part of the state. I'm wondering why isn't there a more significant effort in looking at something like bicycles? Um, that is controversial, I get that. And Representative McGinnis, I've, you and I have talked about this issue on and offline, and I get it. We don't want to stop people from being able to access the trail systems and hurt people that literally have no money or no ability to afford that fee. But I just would hope that the agency would look more closely at this and recognize that there definitely are people, at least at my neck of the woods, that, that are really frustrated that we're having to go to the, the general fund when, when they would like to pull their fair share too and pull their weight too. There's a lot of people that are, like I say, are making a huge investment in their equipment and their bicycles. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they're sitting there saying, you know, the same as, as maybe some others that you're hearing from. Mr. Rivers? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure that there was a question there. <laughs> So we have, I have Representative Wagenius, then Representative Lewick, and then Representative Becker. <laughs> Representative Wagenius. Thank you. If my memory serves correctly, uh, when the legacy amendment first came in, uh, some money was appropriated to DNR for solar. Uh, on, in some Representative Wagenius, we can't, we can't hear you. And, uh, having, excuse me, Representative Wagenius, they're having trouble hearing you. <laughs> Okay, sorry. If, if my memory serves correctly, when the legacy amendment first, we made the first appropriations from a legacy, some of the money was allocated to DNR for solar mm -hmm. on parks and trails. Mm -hmm. uh, is, if I'm right, is that, are those solar still in operation? Have you expanded and then Going forward, uh, when we all know that we have to do mm -hmm. everything we can to uh, protect our outdoors from this, this changing climate, um, do you have proposals for additional uh, renewable energy? Ms. Rivers. Mr. Chair, Representative Wienius, anticipating that you might ask that question. Uh, I had my staff prepare some in information about what Parks and Trails is doing for renewable energy. And I am very proud of the work uh, we have accomplished thus far. Uh, as far as facilities that have renewable energy, the Minnesota State Parks and Trails uh, currently boasts 30 uh, across the system. Those are both wind arrays as well as solar photovoltaic as well as PV thermal ar arrays. In terms of our fleet expenditures, uh, we now have a f uh, 64 um, fleet vehicles within our fleet that are hybrid or all electric or propane. Um, we have a very big fleet, of course, uh, with all the lawnmowers, et cetera, that we have within our system. Um, of that, about a uh, little over a million miles now are driven on hybrid or alternative fuel uh, fleet, fleet vehicles. Um, as far as small projects that have been completed, you mentioned the legacy funds in particular. We've devoted legacy funds, about 3,500 different small projects. Those range from anything as small as changing uh, the kinds of light bulbs that we use within our facilities to motion and dis motion center um, exterior lights and fixtures, as well as <laughs> appliances such as the commercial refrigerators that would exist in our larger facilities. Uh, all told, that's about 886,000 kilowatt hours of savings per year. Uh, across the state park system. In addition, the, the Department of Natural Resources is following uh, the governor's recommendations for um, uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Um, 
within a time certain. That was Governor Dayton's. I assume that it will be part of Governor Wall's initiative as well. Um, as part of that, we have an operational order within the Department of Natural Resources, and each division within the Department of Natural Resources is required to have a division plan. Uh, our division plan reduces um, our carbon footprint, uh, our use of energy resources by 4% uh, each year uh, if the next two years. These are two-year plans. And so we have a robust unit-by-unit uh, unit plans that are now coming in. They were all submitted in December. Um, that will allow us or hopefully get us, not hopefully, they are planful ways to get us toward those reductions uh, in a very systematic way over the course of the next few years. So very proud of what we're doing already here. Um, uh, my resource and asset manager, Mr. Peter Hark, I believe was in the committee a few weeks ago. Uh, he's the one that is spearheading this uh, along with our operations uh, services division, um, Director Lori Martinson, who will be speaking with you uh, about some other budget proposals uh, in the coming days. Representative Wagini is just to follow up, uh, we know that we have to do a lot more and be a lot faster between now and 2030. Do you have a specific game plan between now and 2030? Mr. Chair. Ms. Rivers. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, our plan, uh, we have, we know what the benchmark is at the end, uh, where the governor's office has sort of demanded state agencies be. Uh, we have backtracked that in the Division of Parks and Trails to say if, if we're going to get to, to Z by such and such a year, that means that by 2019 and 2020, we need to accomplish 2% per year. Um, and so our unit level plans within the Division of Parks and Trails um, are methodological approaches for the near term to say this is what we need to do to achieve that 2%. Um, we will continue to invest in things like solar farms and solar energy as well. Um, we believe we have a social responsibility in the Division of Parks and Trails to not only uh, lead by example in this regard, but also to educate others about what we're doing and why. Thank you. Uh, if I particularly like hearing you say lead by example, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner. I apologize for interrupting. Just very quickly, I want to go back to Representative Heinzman's questions about the license fee increases on the, the watercraft. The table on page 52 of the budget book is very confusing. The, the, the number in the very final column that represents the total three-year fee includes a $4.50 issuing fee, which is currently in statute, and the new AIS surcharge increase. So using that nonprofit example, currently they're paying $4.50 for registration, plus a $5 AIS surcharge, plus a $4.50 issuing fee that goes to the deputy registrars. The new proposal would be that five seventy-five, dollars so their, their registration fee would go up a dollar and a quarter. The issuing fee is still there at $4.50, and the AIS surcharge is going from $5 to $7.25. So what they were paying, um, currently they pay $14 for a three-year registration. The new proposal with the AIS surcharge would be that they would go to $17. So it's only a 25% increase. Um, I apologize for the table, the way it's laid out, but that is rather confusing. So just for the record, the nonprofit boats are only going to see a 25% increase, including the AIS surcharge. Thank you. Representative Heinzman. I appreciate that. That's why I was asking before I made the leap if it was 100% uh, surcharge in the it is confusing. No, I just wanted to make sure that we were clarified that for you. So I apologize for that. Okay. Representative Lewitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the things, uh, go back to the, to the uh, uh, state trail system and how we fund that. Um, and right away, I want to make sure we understand the difference between that and, and the dedicated mountain bike trails. Those are, uh, uh, you've got a group of people that do a lot of volunteer work day in day out to keep those trails groomed including groomed in the winter time you do not see that with the with the uh, users that deal with our state uh trail system just don't see it uh once in a while somebody might see a pothole uh if it's in front of their house goes by there they might fix it so there's <laughs> don't want to in any way uh be confused about uh, uh, mountain bike trails and how they're taken care of day in, day out by the people that, uh, that use them uh, in our state trail system. And I, I guess I'd come back and would suggest again, and I it would sure, I can't see how it would be a hard deal for, 
for our, for our new governor because my goodness, he's done a great job of raising every fee and tax that we can find. Why he doesn't take a look at uh, pick some number on a uh, on a new bicycle if you know fifteen hundred dollars you know uh, two thousand whatever the number is and put some type of an excise tax on that and and bring that back uh, uh, for some long term funding because we've got a whole group of users bless their heart uh, that are just riding on a general fund uh, and and uh, you know so so you're going to dig into education take that away you're going to dig into health and human service i mean uh, uh there is a point out there on the, on the price of uh of these bicycles and i'm not talking about necessarily mountain bikes but i'm talking about the ones that go by uh, and they're going to do a 110 mile 20 mile ride that day uh, it, that approaches uh, atvs and and other things and so uh it gets too complicated to try to do a license for every one of those bikes, uh, but maybe at the point of sale. There really should be something uh, to, to deal with that because uh, we're really not able to keep up with what we got on those state trails. We haven't finished what we've already decided we need to have out there, uh, and and uh, I'm not sure going to the general fund uh, is going to, well, again, every time we try that, we're taking it away from the kids or we're taking it away from the nursing homes. <laughs> Ms. Rivers. Mr. Chair and members, um, thank you, Representative Lewick, um, uh, for um, acknowledging the amazing work that the Cuyuna Mountain Bike Crew does uh, to support the mountain bike trails, in particular at uh, Cuyuna Rec area in your district. It's, um, it's phenomenal. These folks uh, give their blood, sweat, and tears, I swear, uh, to that system, and we, uh, we are extraordinarily grateful for all of their, their labor there. Um, I would be remiss uh, to now also acknowledge the other friends groups that exist within the state of Minnesota. There are some 57, I believe, at the last count. Friends groups, either friends groups for trails or friends groups for state parks. Uh, folks who um, also give a, a lot of their time, effort, energy, volunteer money, volunteer time, volunteer sweat equity uh, for projects in our state parks and along our state trails. Uh, so do want to make sure that we acknowledge that uh, that there there are other friends groups out there that are also doing work uh, on on and for state trails as well. Um, the idea of an excise tax is an interesting one, uh, and it's one that we've certainly discussed within the department in the past. Uh, I know that our uh, sister state, brother state, whatever, uh, down in Texas has an excise tax on all outdoor recreation goods. Um, uh, they are in the process this year of, I'm told by their parks director, um, trying to put that into their constitution. So uh, this has been tried in other states. Uh, it was successfully implemented for um, for the state of Texas, so it's something we could certainly consider. Um, mind you that those those fees currently go into the general fund as well. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I Representative Heintzman, uh, the No Child Left Inside bill, um, would actually, this didn't come up, but it actually would be a great opportunity for uh, kids with disabilities. Maybe there are some, some, you know, groups like the ones you mentioned who could take use of that. Um, those might be kids who wouldn't otherwise have access. And I did just want to use uh, this opportunity to, to point out that um, it's generally more respectful to use people first language. So, uh, you know, kids with disabilities as opposed to handicapped or the disabled. Um, it, it's just a, the way most folks prefer um, that, that we talk about those, those groups of people. So just kind of wanted to take the opportunity to remind everybody that that's a more respectful way uh, to talk about those folks. Thanks. Ms. Rivers. If there aren't any other questions, I think I'm done. Commissioner okay. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, that concludes Parks and Trails Division. Now we'd like to bring up Director Steve Colvin of Ecological and Water Resources Division. <coughs> Director Colvin, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Uh, members and thank you uh, for the record my uh, name is Steve Colvin 
and I'm director of the Division of Ecological and Water Resources. The focus of our division today is on healthy lands and waters throughout Minnesota. That's our goal. That's what we work toward in all of our programming. Our ecological and water resources work benefits all Minnesotans. We work with farmers, urban residents, lakeshore owners, businesses, local governments, and other citizens from, with our essential products and services. We provide critical information and regulatory support uh, to maintain Minnesota's sustainable use of its unique biodiversity, high quality public waters, and other natural resources. And so some of the main uh, work that we do in these areas to support uh, natural resources is uh, tr uh, tracking natural resources data and trends for water and land resources, plant and animal populations, and rare species. We also do analysis, a lot of analysis, uh, which we provide in, in a number of different forums uh, and, and have uh, public discussions. Uh, our groundwater management areas are an example of public stakeholder forums that we have used to have some of these. Uh, preventing new infestations and reducing the spread of invasive species. And very importantly, sustainable use and development of the state's water resources. So there are four key areas of our division's work that need additional investment of state funds in the next biennium. And so I think we'll just go to the next slide. And the first one has already been discussed a little bit, and that's increasing voting registration uh, fee or, or surcharge, if you will, for the aquatic invasive species. Stopping the spread and reducing negative impacts of aquatic invasive species is vitally important to Minnesotans. Over time, DNR has been forced to eliminate the state's cost share with lake associations for treatment of existing aquatic invasive species infestations in order to keep our own investments focused on reducing AIS spread and keeping the fund solvent. This shift away from state cost sharing has put pressure on lakeshore property owners and lake associations, as now they have to cover treatment costs fully. The new revenue from this proposal will address the, the structural deficit in the fund balance in this account. So right now we are unable to completely spend our annual appropriations because of the structural deficit in the fund. The governor recommends increasing aquatic invasive species <coughs> surcharge from $5 to $7 and a quarter, which amounts to 75 cents a year, as you heard previously. Uh, the fee has not been increased since 1993, more than 25 years ago. And really, the scope of what's, what work is done under this surcharge has changed quite a bit since then. In the early years, we focused mostly on Eurasian water milfoil and purple loosestrife. Now, in addition to those, we're managing zebra mussels, starry stonewort, invasive carp, and other uh, less uh, common uh, invasive species or, or less abundant invasive species. We're also providing support to counties as they implement their programs and as, they, as their watercraft inspectors need to receive training in order to um, do that work. So this investment will allow us to reinstate local grants for treatment of aquatic invasive plants. It'll provide some funding to enhance our emergency response to new zebra mussel and starry stonewort infestations. And it'll allow us to maintain our very effective inspection, training, public information, and technical management work. The outcomes include improved recreation on our lakes, reduced financial burdens, on lakeshore property owners and reduce the spread and impact of zebra mussels and starry stonewort in public waters. Okay. The next uh, area of investment I'd like to talk about is protecting our public waters. And I just want to make clear at the outset that when I'm talking about this, I am talking about uh, work related to, say, flood damage, 
damages, um, public waters permits, so permits to put in riprap and things like that. It's not about water appropriations. So our public waters protection program ensures a balance between conservation and use. And protecting Minnesota public waters is fundamental to maintaining our quality of life. Our current funding model is not working for a couple reasons. Application fee income is too low to support our program costs. And secondly, much of our public waters protection work doesn't really involve a specific permit application. So an example of that that I'll provide is, is uh, just the other day, my um, southern regional manager informed me that he was deploying staff uh, out to inspect uh, lake outlets where we've been receiving numerous high water complaints. And so that's work that we need to do, get out there and help out. It's not work that uh, involves a permit. This investment will allow, oh, so what is the investment? We're looking at a governor recommendation of $1.6 million for the biennium from the general fund, plus 716,000 from the water manage account, management account, which, which will be through an increase in permit application fees. Currently, uh, minimum ac application fee for an individual permits $150. Maximum is 1,000. The proposal is to increase the minimum to 300 and the maximum to 3,000. This investment will allow us to do a lot of important water management work, uh, continued economic, ensure economic growth continues without impacts to public water resources, enhancing public safety through flood risk reductions. Uh, increasing property values through better shoreline management, responding to floods and lake level concerns, uh, and providing technical assistance to lakeshore owners, communities, and other agencies. If the, uh, if the proposal isn't adopted, we are looking at a fairly significant reduction in uh, the work of this program. We're looking at losing up to 12 FTEs. That means our technical assistance to local governments will become much more limited. It also means that with fewer people to process permit applications, they will of course take longer for us to do. Representative Green has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the testifier, um, just to help me understand here, the proposal, you're looking at increasing public water permit fees. Who's going to pay those fees? Mr. Chair, Robin. Representative, um, those fees are paid by um, sometimes individual landowners, uh, sometimes businesses, sometimes government entities uh, to do a wide range of uh, public water work activity. So if, if they're rip wrapping, uh, they'll do it, uh, dredging projects, uh, projects that involve placing fill in the lakes, uh, all require uh, permits. Now for uh, individual homeowners, we do have low thresholds of work that can be done on a uh, home scale that would not require a permit. So we do have uh, some, some stuff that doesn't require a permit for individual homeowners. Representative Green. Mr. Chair, on the 1.6 million uh, to enhance technical assistance to individuals, businesses, and local government units, um, you're going, to, it looks like you're going to charge them an increased fee and then you want money from the general fund to help them pay for the fee? Director Colvin. Mr. <coughs> Chair, Representative, we uh, provide technical assistance to local governments, let's say as, as an uh, example, for many different things. Uh, some of those involve uh, a permit application and consultation as we uh, process permit application. Other, th other things do not. So uh, last uh, summer uh, when uh, there was bad flooding uh, out in southwestern Minnesota, our staff were out there helping highway authorities and others identify uh, where there were problems. 
uh, and uh, consult with them on ways that they could uh, fix those problems. So it's it's really a combination of things. And it, we're not, the intention is not to charge a higher fee um, and then subsidize their help uh, with um, a general fund increase. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. just really quickly, we couldn't establish a permit fee that would be high enough to cover all of our costs under this program. So it's important to realize we are trying to keep fees low and supplement those activities with general funds. So we can provide more detailed spending on our, on our water related activities, but we're trying to maintain as low a possible fee schedule and subsidize that with general fund activities so that these users, local units of government, citizens, businesses, don't have to pay to support the entire program because as, as Director Colvin stated, the public waters are our public waters. They need to be protected for everybody's use. So that's, a, that's part of the, I think, confusion you may be having about this proposal is it's blended, right? We have a, a small fee increase and a large general fund support to, to fund the entire package. So Representative Green, we can provide more information to you exactly how, what that looks like and who pays those fees. Uh, we'll provide to the entire committee if desired, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess I, I would just have a suggestion uh, that you go back and look really hard at uh, the level of permits and the so-called uh, support for local units of government, for example, uh, by your field staff. Uh, and I can think of two uh, situations, one where a city was trying to replace a bridge uh, that was in place uh, had been there for 50 some years uh, uh, and uh, I'll be quite frank with you um, that quote permitting uh, an expertise from your staff drove uh, that city to spend a whole lot of additional money on engineering and all kinds of things simply to sort of sort out uh, the things that your staff were doing relative to um, uh, endangered species and other things. And, and another circumstance uh, where uh, we got into a situation where we thought we might have an endangered species someplace in a lake, uh, and we went a couple years where we delayed a project. And again, uh, that drove up uh, a huge uh, amount of cost to that local township because every time your staff would show up with, well, we think maybe and we can't do it till next year, then they had to go back and get a hold of their engineering people. So uh, I would suggest that the real root of the problem here is to really look at the scope uh, and that, that help that you speak of is not always the kind of technical help uh, uh, that is frankly do it as anything but drive the cost of, of uh, putting a culvert in or fixing something on a township road. Uh, and so I, I, I don't, you know, we don't need more money on this. We need to go back and look at the scope of what you're exactly doing because I think it's, it's way, way broader than it needs to be. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, oh. Mr. Chair we're working on those yeah. issues. We understand, Representative Luke, I've worked with you closely on yeah. both of those situations. And an example, you'll see a bill coming forward dealing with threatened and endangered species and, and the county engineers in Minnesota Department of Nat or Department of Transportation. We are working closely with them to make sure that we're protecting species we need to, but also recognizing work in this disturbed area that has already been done. So we do look at that closely, but there, there, there's a yin and a yang to it. Um, and sometimes you don't see those species only at certain times of the year, which delays things as well. So Director Colvin and his, and his team, they do a good job uh, trying to do the best they can to reduce those, what some people might look at as problems. <laughs> How, how well we know on the, uh, what, purple flowering bladderwort that only appears in a two-month period late in the summer, but that blows an entire construction period uh, uh, as, and, and of course, it might be there. Uh, so, but that's an example of trying to balance out. Uh, in the meantime, we threaten emergency response, school buses, and all kinds of other things that have to travel that road. So, thank you. Remember, if we have about five minutes left, uh, I would remind folks to keep uh, the book, leave the books here. Uh, and then also, if you've written in the books, like 
personal notes, maybe you want to write your name on the book so we don't <laughs> mess up the books. So, Mr. Chairman, your, we just your have three more book. slides up for, for Director Colvin, which would be great to, to end with yep. ecological water resources. I think, Representative Fabian, did you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair, yes. Um, so, uh, Director Colvin, uh, you talked on one of your slides, page 17, in my little booklet that I have here about Starry Stonewort. Um, I've been to Lake Coronas and I've spent a, an afternoon with uh, a few people. I, and quite frankly, um, I want to say this nicely, they didn't see the DNR as a problem solver in that situation. They saw the DNR more as a roadblock uh, to solving the problem in the lake, working with the lake association and people and so forth. I'm not exactly sure the details. Tell me specifically what you're doing, particularly Lake Coronas, to address the concerns uh, related to Starry Stonewort. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, what um, we're continuing to attempt to work with the Lake Association uh, for reference folk. Uh, uh, lake Cronus was the first lake uh, in which starry stonewort was discovered in the state, and it, it was not an early infestation. It had clearly been there for some period of time, which limited the um, options that are available. We, we still work with the Lake Association on treatment. Where we're really targeting efforts is in some of the new smaller infestations, for example, this year Medicine Lake, where if we can act aggressively at the get-go, we might be able to minimize uh, that particular infestation and thereby minimize uh, movement of the species to other places. One real quick uh, more question, Mr. Chair. I think I heard you say, and I just want to be clear, that uh, on your um, fee increases, you said that some fees are going to go from $300 to $3,000. Did I hear that correctly? Help me out. Mr. Chair, Representative, no, from $1,000 to $3,000. And those would be on extremely large projects. Okay, and then, so that was individuals, you said. What's it going to be for municipals? City of it includes, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, it includes all. So it'd be highly unlikely for an individual to have a, a project that would generate that large a fee. Uh, an example of a uh, project that would receive a $3,000 application fee is something like the uh, dredging project uh, currently underway in... Um, Help me out. A lake. Oh, Lake Pep. Or down. Shell Rock River. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so that one's, they're looking at 12,000 cubic yards of material m removal, and that would be a $3,000 permit application. It's about a $25 million project. Mr. Chairman, I'm just to go through two, two quick, quick slides. slides. The Pine Land Sand Study. You've seen this before. We've talked about this previous bienniums dealing with uh, the pineland sands conversion from pines to, to agricultural up in Park Rapids area. We need to do some work to determine what is the appropriate level of irrigation and water appropriation. Are there additional things that can be done to make sure that not only it's not that it's a last in first out system as we look at water <laughs> appropriation, but how can we sustainably operate appropriate water enough for everybody's needs agriculture, industry, commercial, and residential use. So it's very important for us to get a good handle on this situation. There's, we'll be providing more testimony and talking points on this in the future. Um, but it is not new. It's been going on for some time. We've been petitioned twice by two organizations to do an EAW. Uh, we've turned those down, and we'd rather do go down this approach to take a more holistic approach with all of the stakeholders at the table talking about what the impacts are and what the futures of future of this region is. Representative Purcell knows firsthand the pressures that are going on up there, and I think most of you have been aware of this issue for some time. Representative Purcell has a question. Thank you. And Mr. Meyer, um, would you be using the Minnesota Geologic Survey in your efforts? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative Purcell, their work would be critical as, as that geological survey determines where that water is going, and, and a lot of other data and research as well. This, there would be a possibility to do this through EQB if that was a desire through, through the board. 
So that's always a possibility. Just getting the work done somehow is very important to us and the community. Uh, lastly, as we talked about previously with Parks and Trails, we're looking for $22.3 million in clean water funding that will be going through the Legacy Committee and, and stopping here, I would assume, at some point in time. Mr. Chairman, that brings us to Fish and Wildlife that we will start or we will present on Thursday. So we'll have Fish and Wildlife Enforcement, Forestry, <coughs> Operations Support, Lands and Minerals. They're not quite as intensive as the ones we've gone through today. So and it's also our intent to move the Outdoor Heritage Bill out of committee on Thursday. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>